Yeah. And you got your oven. What do you think? It's the Ultra 90C. Right? Why? Why not? You give it to me? No. I'll give it to you if you do all the work. Okay, sorry, Jude. Oh, right. Okay. I'm Peter Robinson. Um, I work for Red Hat um, on IoT um, and all sorts of various other bits and pieces. Um, my co-presenter over hiding to the side here um, can introduce himself and actually get into the line of the camera. Yeah, hello. I'm Robert Wolf, uh, 96 Sports Community Manager for Lenaro. And... Um, yeah, so we're just going to talk about um, AI and machine learning using uh, Fedora as an operating system and stack um, on the 96 boards AI um, platforms. Um, so Robert will give a brief overview of the 96 boards ecosystem. Um, we'll cover off some of the various hardware for AI and machine learning, um, how we're going to do AI and machine learning on Fedora, um, and some of the pros and cons and issues we are facing in dealing that, um, and how we're going to try and tie it all together between the 96 Boards AI initiative and Fedora as a whole um, to give a cohesive um, sort of end user opportunity um, across a whole range of hardware. Great, yeah, so as Peter mentioned, I'm going to first talk about 96 boards, the ecosystem in itself, and then how it relates to Fedora and how we're going to move forward with 96 boards and Fedora. So the 96 boards ecosystem, um, I'm, I'm guessing at least some of you have heard of what 96 boards is, but basically it's a single board computer or an open hardware specification. I'm gonna kind of quote this right here, but it's a, it, the hardware spec is open, not the hardware itself, right? So it's an open hardware specification. And um, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but first I wanna give a little bit of a history of what Lenaro is and what 96 boards is and why we started 96 boards. So Lenaro, as you can see there, founded in 2010, um, originally was created to reduce the redundancies and fragmentation in the Linux on ARM ecosystem. And there was a big problem that they faced in these, this five-year gap, which was basically trying to provide the development hardware, the platform for the developers to work on. And back in the day, and not even that long ago, uh, trying to get your hands on this ARM-based hardware was first of all very took a long time to get it and second of all it was very expensive and so a bunch of big companies got together and said hey you know what let's design a specification let's call it 96 boards and we're going to make it easier and cheaper for people to get their hands on this hardware that they need to develop on that's when 96 boards was born and so you have a specification soc agnostic specification that allows vendors to come together build boards out so that you know you can develop on them and do what you need to do for reasonable price all right, so as I mentioned, 96 boards is a series of open hardware specifications. Right now we have three specs. You have the consumer edition, the enterprise edition, and the IoT edition. Um, right now, we're trying to work on a strong hardware and software story. This is basically creating the layer of hardware for you to develop on. The operating system, which we're working with Fedora, Peter right here in Fedora, to get a strong software story at an operating system level. And then after that comes the application level so that you can develop on multiple system on chips um, without really feeling uh, too much of a difference when you're transitioning your development. Uh, our model is a partner-based model, so 96 boards as a whole, you have a bunch of partners that come together, uh, industry partners, and they are the ones who decide which direction this takes. Peter, in fact, is one of those steering committee members uh, representing uh, Fedora, Red Hat on, on the board there, but um, there are a lot of members we have. And CentOS. Yeah, so I represent the Red Hat ecosystem, so primarily at the moment, uh, Fedora, um, RHEL, CentOS, uh, primarily more the community distributions 
Um, and you know, one of the things that you know Fedora in particular provides is that across the boards that we currently support in Fedora, and there's going to be you know a bunch of extra ones coming along in F29, is that it's the same kernel, um, the same you know experience that you get on x86. So same kernel, SE Linux, Grub, various other bits and pieces. So it's just a unified experience. Um, doesn't matter what device you're running on. Yeah, this is a big this is a big deal because you know uh, you, you have partners from all different types of uh, all different branches of the industry all come together to kind of try and figure out the best way to build this hardware and bring it to the developers. So it is not just one person saying this is how I think it should be. It's a bunch of people coming together and saying that's this is what we think it should be and then testing it out. Uh, with the ninety six boards within the eco within the ninety six boards ecosystem, um, we have a pretty vibrant and growing community, and it's not ninety six boards isn't that old. But, uh, you know, we are seeing a lot of traction in the community and it is growing. So um, if you do have any questions or ways to, if you would like to find a way to get a hold of us or how to get, you know, involved in the community, you can reach out to me afterwards. Initiatives, this is one of the ways that we push forward with 96 boards, uh, kind of launching initiatives. And since we are a partner-based company, a partner-based department, uh, we seek a lot of help from our partners. You know, reaching out to Red Hat, Qualcomm's, iLinks, Avnet, Aero, basically every single person that's involved, every company that's involved with us, we try launching initiatives in parallel with these other companies. So um, we kind of push forward together. Uh, one, of, one of these initiatives, for example, is our Mezzanine Community. This is an open source repository that we pushed out there that allows people to grab onto um, all of these design files, whether you're building in uh, KiCad, EagleCAD, Altium, and a few others. We put out the templates there so that then you can build on add-on devices. And of course, um, the 96 Boards AI is another one of those initiatives. 96 Boards AI is another one, and I'm actually going to talk about that right now. So 96 Boards AI, this is a, a, an attempt that we are, we are pushing out to basically basically create a a compartmentalized section of 96 boards where we're saying these boards we think are the best uses for AI. And so we basically chose um, a few right now, we're calling it kind of like AI compliant for this purpose. Uh, and we want to create the ultimate software hardware application story um, for these boards. Now on the top you have the Rock 960, in the middle you have the Xilinx, which is the um, yeah, Ultra 96. Right. It's this one here, um, quad core ARM 64 bit processor, uh, fairly high end FPGA, and a couple of real time um, capable co processors as well on board, um, all in something you know about the size of a credit card. Um, so, fairly powerful, fairly small, sort of like literally pocket size. Um, so, it's a cool little device. Yeah, and as you can see, you know, looking at the spec, these boards all have the same footprint. And most of the things that, you know, companies would say, you know, reinventing the wheel or being redundant in their development or in their IP, you could say, uh, you don't really focus on those things. You know, the general I.O., the USB ports, HDMI, you can create your niche on this footprint that without having to, you know, worry about too much IP, right? So uh, here, for instance, if if you say this is like the standard consumer edition board, you can see this kind of replicated right here on the bottom half of this one. This is an extended version of the consumer edition board. And so this is one attempt right here reaching out to AI and so we're going to focus on the most. But 96 boards is trying to tackle other verticals, creating software stories for other verticals. And this is just one of them, right? So um, with that, I think this, that's the last of my slides. So we can talk more about 96 boards after if you have more questions. Yeah, so um, in Fedora, we obviously um, are working closely with the 96 board guys. There's also um, other, um, so some of the NVIDIA Jetson um, ones we're looking at for sort of GP, GPU um, as well. Um, you know, the actual AI machine learning hardware, there's four main categories of hardware. There's the FPGA stuff, the Xilinx, 
um, a number of other boards. Um, so Intel's Altera, the latter size 40 is um, fairly popular. Obviously GPGPU um, led primarily by NVIDIA with the CUDA framework, um, but obviously there's um, other ones that support open CPU, um, open CL standard. Um, a new category which we're still sort of, um, which the rock chips and the high silicon ultra 970 um, support, have onboard in, uh, neural processing units. Um, and then Qualcomm has sort of a D, um, DSP, which also provides a neural processing engine. Um, so there's a number of different sort of hardware categories um, in there that, you know, we're working to support well in Fedora. Um, some of them are currently supported in the kernel and tool chains and what have you a little bit better than others. Um, so AI and machine learning has like a number of different stacks. Um, there's obviously TensorFlow that came out of uh, Google originally that is getting a lot of traction, but there's Cafe, T-Engine, Torch, and numerous other sort of um, high-level stacks um, to do. Um, there's a bunch of low-level tool chains. Um, these are currently widely variable. Um, there's like the ICE 40, that I, uh, the latest ICE 40 that I mentioned earlier has quite a good um, open source tool chain. Um, the Xilinx stuff is a bit variable at the moment, although um, the open source side of that is evolving very, very quickly. Um, some of the neural processing engines um, I'm still sort of investigating because a bunch of them are quite new on the market. Um, but as a result of that, this space is changing quite quickly. Um, and, you know, the hardware, software, so like um, TensorFlow, for example, is very CUDA-oriented currently, um, although there's a number of, you know, organisations that are trying to sort of make that less sort of platform-specific. Um, so the hardware, software interface um, is evolving pretty quickly. Um, if, I, if I could add, actually, on that real quick. Of course you can. So with the FPGA space right now, um, Xilinx in particular, uh, they're working on a, uh, an SDK called SDSOC, and with that, they're trying to bring the learning curve down for those of those of you who are interested in developing on FPGAs. So, in particular, talking about the Ultra 96 board that that Peter has right here, um, you'll have opportunities to you know check out this SDK. And in fact, if you buy the Ultra 96, you get a year worth of this license. It is a it is closed license, but it is still a very interesting tool. And uh, basically, what it does is it allows you to code in a language that you're more comfortable with, and then it compiles it for the FPGA. So you can actually work on the hardware without being, you know, a full-blown FPGA developer if you're not familiar with that. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and then, you know, how, how does this very wide and varied ecosystem sort of come together with 96 boards and Fedora? Um, so we're working together um, along with some others to um, get a unified experience. So at the moment, um, like some of the devices come with Android on them, some come with um, very custom distros of Linux um, that don't support, you know, standardized things that, you know, a lot of people are coming to expect like containers um, and various other bits and pieces, um, wildly varying versions of the kernel um, that are generally full of CVEs and especially with you know some of the recent Spectre and Meltdown stuff um, you know are very not up to date um, and, and so we're working to provide a unified experience so that doesn't matter the board you have, doesn't matter the um, you know, hardware machine learning options that are available, um, you'll be able to like get Fedora on there, you'll be able to run containers exactly as you would on x86. Um, and, you know, you know, and then access whether it be the FPGA or the GPU or whatever. Um, so essentially be able to eventually install TensorFlow and have it work on the varying underlying units um, without um, you know, a difference in experience across there. 
And so, you know, a wide variety of AI machine learning hardware, but one OS um, and, you know, like everything else in the Fedora ecosystem, you'll be able to run, you know, Docker and containers or whatever else on top of that in exactly the same way as you would on um, other architectures um, with all the expected security level things like SE Linux and SecComp and, you know, basically a, a unified experience. Um, and, you know, it's going to take us a while to get there. In Fedora 29, um, we've got initial support at the kernel level for things like the FPGA manager and various other um, mechanisms. And, you know, it's going to be a bit of a long road um, with lots of work to do. But, um, you know, it's starting with Fedora 29. And, you know, as it evolves over time, um, there's the ice stack, I think it's called, um, which will be usable with the um, ice 40 FPGAs. And you know, as the open source tools evolve, um, it you know should in the next year or so become a sort of relatively nice, straightforward experience, no matter what the underlying hardware is. Um, so, does anyone have any questions, Stephen? Um, can you give any, any examples of uh, projects or uh, or uh, initiatives that are working uh, working with this in Fedora today or soon? That you, uh, and you know specific uh, goals that they're trying to achieve with this. Um, so. Yeah, so there's um, a number of different sort of IoT, like I'm, I sort of started to get involved in some of this because I have IoT people that are interested in this um, working for it in different industries um, for different um, one of the, and I also had a chat at Flock last week um, with um, someone from Amazon about their Greengrass project, which is a project that runs locally using Amazon technologies, but local AI and machine learning. Um, so that's an IoT gateway use case um, that uh, is happening. Um, there's a number of like industries within the IoT space that are very interested in FPGA for IoT local processing and intelligence. So that's primarily my focus. Um, the Ultra 96 was demoed at the last Connect, running a real-time number plate recognition, or number plate signs. And, and it was processing like, like thousands and thousands of signs a second. Um, and I was hoping to be able to demo it, but we didn't really have enough time to do a talk and a demo all in um, sort of 25, 30 odd minutes. And so, um, but um, I've been planning on getting that up and running so people can deploy that with Ansible as a sort of standard um, on the Xilinx FPGA. So th there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest in a lot of different sort of areas for that sort of stuff. And I'll, and I'll add that, that also um, there's a uh, yeah there's the, building an application layer on top of this right there we've been talking 96 boards we've been talking with Mozilla and their IOT.Mozilla initiative and so we're hopefully going to be working with that to, to try enabling uh, the Mozilla IOT gateway across all of this hardware using Fedora so this kind of like another example of the application layer taking advantage of this unification across the OS and across the hardware yeah that doesn't necessarily use it at the moment FPGA stuff, but th th there are other sort of projects that are um, like the next generation of the Mycroft hardware is going to use the Xilinx FPGA. Um, so we'll be able to, my intention is that we can run that um, on Fedora and that'll be used for like uh, voice recognition. Uh, hi. Uh, you guys mentioned about uh, writing in uh, your uh, in a programming language you are comfortable in, then you guys would uh, the software would compile it for FPGAs. I just wanted to know how uh, how comparable is the execution time of this program compared to uh, FPGA specific programming language? Like if I if I had written the same program in something which was FPGA. Compared. 
So I think you're, the, I think the question is, how comparable is the speed compared to programming it through their SDK versus doing it like with Verilog or um, you know the low level? I don't know actually the answer to that. If Nor do I. Um, that that is a Xilinx tool, um, and I'm not sure the exact details about uh, their tool chain. From, from my understanding, though, is that um, for most applications, from when I hear them talking, is that it's not noticeable unless you go really deep, you know, so it, you wouldn't notice it that much. Yeah. I'm still trying to um, understand the why. Why would I want to do ML on these little boards? Is it because you're envisioning a future where maybe they have sensors and sets? They want to do like local compute, uh, yes. train models locally. Is that the idea? So, yeah. So, I, I mean. I don't know the specs of this FPGA, but it's a fairly high-end FPGA with basically some ARM um, compute attached to it. So you can run like a Linux distribution to do generic stuff, hand over the specifics to the FPGA. Um, it's also got two ARM um, Cortex-R cores on it, so you can run like an RTOS at full real time um, on it. And the idea is that you know you could embed this in a light pole with a camera attached to do real time machine learning on the edge without having to push it back into the cloud. So you may have you know a low level like LoRa or like you know 64K style link that you don't have have the ability to push you know gigabits of or um, tens of megabits a second data up into the cloud to process it. Um, so you would do it locally. Um, you know, if in a lot of cases you may not have the connectivity like out in the field or on a ship in the middle of the ocean. Um, and, and so, you know, it's fairly low power, power in terms of actual power draw, but it's a high-end processing that you can offload to do extensive stuff locally. It, 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 it's also, you know, really important to note that, you know, as developers, maybe you're not so much interested in the path to product, right? But there is a strong path to product with these boards. So, I mean, you can work hand in hand with Xilinx and Avnet and the folks that made this board to, you know, do a chip down design, get your own product out there, right? So, like, once you get up to a certain amount of units, it's no longer worth it to put this board in your end product, right? You're going to want to get rid of some USB ports and save a penny here and a penny there. And then next thing you know... You know, um, that, that that's this is your your tool for your path to product, right? So it's it's a development device. Yeah. But yes, and and also you it because it's a relatively cheap, relatively standard. Um, it's useful for developers to put one on their desk um, so that they can play around with proof of concepts at little cost. Um, using you know standard tools, standard distro um, to get things up and running because you know basically you can DNF install um, just as you would on you know an x86 server or you know a VM running in the cloud. Any more questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.